ألف لام الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم نزل عليك الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بين يديه وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل من قبل هدى للناس وأنزل الفرقان إن الذين كفروا بآيات الله لهم عذاب شديد والله عزيز ذو انتقام إن الله لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon all the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent from the beginning of time up to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah to bless all of them and to bless their companions and those who supported them, those who struggled and strived to protect the deen that Allah had revealed and to pass it on to others in a way that today, Alhamdulillah, it has come to us. May Allah bless us all and grant us every form of goodness and make us from those who can continue the message and pass it through to our children. And inshallah, may we be from amongst those whom the Almighty is pleased with. Beloved brothers and sisters, we had commenced yesterday the story of the ascension and the story of the journey by night known as Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And this had happened as a gift to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after what was known as the year of sorrow or grief or sadness, Amul Huzn, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had lost his uncle, he lost his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, he lost meaning he went to At-Ta'if and there also he was beaten and he was made to bleed and they did not accept the message. He came back to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah and persecutions continued there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a gift. And in the 11th year of prophethood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam whilst the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was resting in the house of Umm Hani, as we mentioned yesterday, his cousin. And that is where he was sleeping. And Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam came and took him to Al Baytul Haram, to where the Kaaba is. And Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam there had, according to the narrations, slit the chest of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, removed his heart and washed it with Zamzam. This was again, this had happened in the past and it repeated itself according to the books of the seerah thrice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. It was washed with zamzam. The angels had come and washed the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, filled it with yaqeen. And as we know, the conviction is one of the most important things when it comes to belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when it comes to Islam and Muslimin. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was then taken on what was known as a buraq. Buraq, an animal which is not between a mule and a donkey, a white animal. And it took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Mecca to Al-Mukarramah all the way to Jerusalem in Baytul Maqdis in Jerusalem. Masjid Al-Aqsa as we know it today. And with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there in no time. But as he was traveling, he noticed everything on the way. Subhanallah. He noticed everything on the way. When he got there, subhanallah, he was made to meet some of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from amongst them. Jesus may peace be upon him. From amongst them, Moses may peace be upon him. Ibrahim, Abraham may peace be upon him. Isa, Musa, Ibrahim alayhim salam These were some of the prophets who were there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instructed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Baytul Maqdis, in Masjid Al-Aqsa, in the particular place, to lead them in prayer with two rak'ah of prayer. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an Imam. He led them in prayer and then he came out and he was taken up to the heavens. We believe that before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Jesus, may peace be upon him, was taken up. He was taken up in body and soul. And he was taken up alive before he was crucified, before he was killed. We believe that there was no crucifixion, nor was there any killing. 
But before they could harm him, he was taken up to heavens, the heavens. And at the moment he is there. And at the same time, we also believe that he will be returning before the end of time. This is the belief of the Muslims. That Jesus, may peace be upon him, is alive. He has been taken up into the heavens by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. He is in the second heaven. And he will return to the earth closer to the end of time. So it had happened in the past. It is nothing impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here it happened again. This time Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken up to the heavens with Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, may peace be upon him. Taken all the way up as they got to the first heaven. A caller called asking a question as they wanted to enter. Who are you? I am Jibreel. Who is with you? Muhammad is with me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Has he been sent for? Which means he's invited here. Yes, he is. It opened and he went in. Lo and behold, he met Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. First heaven. So Adam alayhi salam, the first of human beings and the first of those who were sent to his own children in order to remind them what was right and wrong. He welcomed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only as a child, because obviously he is the father, but also as a colleague. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. And Alhamdulillah, thereafter, after meeting him and being welcomed, he proceeded up with Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam to the second heaven. As they got up, again the same question asked and they were allowed in again. And he met two people. Who were they? Two prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One was Jesus, may peace be upon him. And as we said, Jesus, Isa alayhi salatu wa salam is alive. And he was taken up in the condition that he was alive. So we believe that he did not die. May Allah's peace be upon him. And with him was Yahya alayhi salatu was salam, the one known as John, John the Baptist. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them both and grant them goodness. And may we be from amongst those who learn a lesson from the beautiful life of Jesus. May peace be upon him and from his sacrifices and miracles. And the same time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who realize that the end of prophethood came with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are fortunate to be from his ummah. After that, he proceeded to the next heaven. When he proceeded, in fact, he was welcomed by the two. And the same thing happened where they, they welcomed him, congratulated him. And he proceeded to the third heaven. In the third heaven, he met Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. The most handsome of all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith says he was granted half of all beauty, subhanallah. So the other half, the other 50% is split between the rest of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and make us from amongst those really who can appreciate whatever we look like. I've actually said it in the past, your identity, you did not apply for it. It's Allah who chose it for you. Don't get upset. A person this way, that way, every one of us has something that will not be perfect. You know, you have one shoulder a little bit low, a little bit, no one notices it. You have a nose slightly this way, one eye a bit bigger, smaller, one brow this way, that way. Don't worry. You cannot get it perfect, number one. Number two is, if you become conscious, you only become from amongst those who are ungrateful to Allah. Don't worry. Whatever you look like is unique. That is you. That's what makes you you. Allahu Akbar. May Allah be pleased with us and may we be pleased also with Allah's decisions for us. So, he was welcomed again, mashallah, Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam welcomed him and thereafter they proceeded to the next heaven. Another messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Idris alayhi salam, he was there, he met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Jibreel, he welcomed them and so on. As they progressed up the heavens, every time they were asked, who was it? The answer came, Jibreel, who is with you? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has he been called for? Yes, he has. Then the gates open and they go up into the next heaven. The, the next heaven, they met Harun alayhi salatu was salam. That was the fifth heaven. Harun alayhi salatu was salam, he welcomed them and mashallah, thereafter they proceeded to one of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who went through a lot. Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And the Prophet Musa alayhi salam welcomed them and mashallah, he was so happy to meet them. And thereafter, as they are progressing, one narration says he began to cry. Musa alayhi salam. One narration says this, it's important that we make mention of it. And when he was asked, what is it? He says, because you are a messenger who will have many more followers on the day of Qiyamah than myself. Subhanallah. And then they proceeded to the next heaven. 
where they met Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, seventh heaven, the Prophet Abraham, upon the highest level, the father of most of the prophets, the father of the prophets who came after him, including Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When they met him, mashallah, he welcomed them and they saw what is known as Al Baytul Ma'mur. It is a house that is visited by the angels. Reportedly, 70,000 angels enter this place of worship, which is above the Kaaba, directly above the Kaaba, going very high above the seventh heaven. And the angels engage in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every day, 70,000 angels enter and the same angels do not return. The next day, there is another 70,000. And that happens every single day up to the end of time. Allahu Akbar. So imagine the number of angels there are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us goodness. Do you know that the Quran makes mention of the dua of the angels? The angels ask Allah to forgive those who believe. And the angels ask Allah to forgive those who are repenting. And the angels engage in seeking forgiveness for those on earth. The angels declare the praise of their Rabb and they seek forgiveness for those on earth. Subhanallah. Look at how lucky we are. When we are sitting now here, anyone who is engaged in anything wherein they are becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels have encircled them and the blessings of Allah descending upon them. And the angels are praying for them, making dua for them, seeking forgiveness for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may he make us feel that this is why we say don't miss an occasion to learn more of your religion, to purify your knowledge and to authenticate it and to learn as much as you can in order for you to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the days pass instead of getting further away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us close. Now, a quick mention before we go further. The journey by night from Mecca to Jerusalem was known as Al-Isra. This, an entire surah has been named after. Glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who took his slave on a journey by night from Makkah to Mukarrama to Jerusalem, the place around which Allah has blessed in order for him, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be shown by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People cannot deny it, especially today, because we know how quick we can make a journey to the other corner of the world. And we know that technology has progressed even further than what a passenger aircraft can take you. Meaning as quick as a passenger aircraft. The passenger aircraft are very slow. They had had a Concorde. Why did they stop it? Because of a few disasters. But they have means of transport even faster than a Concorde. It's just that people cannot risk making use of it. Allahu Akbar. If you take a look at the missiles they have, within a few seconds they arrive where they have to. Allah protect us. Subhanallah. Imagine if someone had to sit on one of them. Allahu Akbar. Make sure there's no warhead there, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness. And may He make us from amongst those who realize and understand nothing is impossible for Allah. Also, going up to the heavens, we made mention of Isa alayhi salam already having done that. And he remained there. The difference is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back to tell us. He actually came back and he informed us so accurately as we will see in a few moments. That ascension was known as Mi'raj. The Mi'raj going up. The Buraq did not go up with them. But it was Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam who took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in what is known as Mi'raj. Like an elevator going all the way up by the will of Allah. How exactly it happened? That we will only find out when we ourselves get to the Akhirah. But we believe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that firm belief and conviction. So thereafter, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was made to go even higher. 
And he spoke with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He spoke with his Rabb. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this occasion of Mi'raj. When he had gone up beyond the seventh heaven, there is something at the end of the seventh heaven, a huge lote tree known as Sidratul Muntaha. It is the final, the last tree, a huge tree describing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa describes its fruit and its leaves as being like the ears of elephants and so on. And subhanallah, a huge tree you cannot see its beginning and cannot see its end. A huge tree and that depicts the end of the seventh heaven beyond which is what I named Baytul Ma'mur moments ago. We spoke about it. The house that is visited by the angels and the house wherein the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes place by the angels. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the discussion that happened within that discussion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a gift. A gift of what? A gift of salah. Salah. This prayer, we pray it five times a day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, that your followers should pray 50 times a day. That's a gift. Imagine salah is a gift. It protects us from so much. It disciplines us. It trains us. Control of your gaze, control of your movements, control of what goes in and out of your mouth. Everything in salah. I cannot eat in salah because I need to train myself. And at the same time, act of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have so many medical benefits of salah. Although the prime aim of reading salah is for the pleasure of Allah. But we achieve so much. You know, they call it a byproduct. It might not be exactly what you had aimed for, but you're getting so much more. They've thrown in freebies, so to speak, in our language today. You have perks, mashallah. You know, you have a job, mashallah, you get a salary, and at the same time, you get perks. So because I'm working here, I get this and I get that. My children's school fees is paid, and this happens. And even if I've got 10 children, it, everyone will benefit, subhanallah. This is a different example because it's Allah. Walillahi mathalul a'la. Allah has the highest of examples. So. The only point being raised is when we fulfill salah, we will have so many side benefits, although the main purpose of fulfilling it would be for the pleasure of Allah in order to obey the instruction of Allah wholeheartedly. So it was a gift. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was coming down now. And when he came down, Musa alayhi salam was quick to ask him what happened there. So he says, well, this is what happened. And I spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I was given a gift of 50 salah. He says, no, go back. Go back to do what? Go back and ask for a decrease because your ummah is not going to manage. 50 salah a day, they're not going to manage. So the Prophet ﷺ went back up and it was revised downwards by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 45. As he's coming back, Musa alayhi salam sends him back. Go back again. 45, still no good. And in fives, it kept on coming down until it stopped at five. Subhanallah, five. And on top of that, Muhammad was told that those who fulfill the five correctly will have a reward multiplied by 10. So equivalent to 50. Subhanallah. We still, imagine I, whenever I read this hadith, I think of one thing. I think what if it was me or you there? Even the five, we would have probably said, you know what, let's revise it downwards to perhaps have it one a day, you know, or maybe even five a year or something of that nature. Allah forgive us. Wallahi. Why I say this is perhaps that might not be the case, but we are so lazy. Even the five that we do fulfill, if we fulfill them with such laziness, what if we had had 50? Subhanallah. Don't we owe Musa alayhi salam? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all. These were the prophets all related to one another, mashallah. And they really, they served us in a very great way. Salawat rabbi wa salamuhu alayhim jami'an. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them all. Amen. So mashallah, this was the gift of salah. And the hadith continues to say, whoever fulfills a deed multiplied by 10. And on top of that, at, on the same occasion, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told, Something that brings tears to the eyes. Whoever fulfills a good deed, that good deed shall be multiplied by 10. And whoever intends to do a good deed, but did not manage to fulfill the intention, they will have a reward for that. And whoever intends to do a bad deed, but does not do it, 
neither will they have a reward nor a sin. So you plan to do a bad deed, but you didn't do it. No reward, no sin. And whoever plans to do a bad deed and executes it will get one sin next to their name. Allahu Akbar. Look at how the evil is not multiplied by the mercy of Allah. But the good is multiplied by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we were granted at that point of Mi'raj. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is a question. Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He was asked that when he returned. Did you see Allah? He says, Noorun anna arah. Aisha radiallahu anha was also asked. Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah? Speaking we know, but did he see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? She said, Noorun anna yarah. He is such noor. How would it have been possible for him to see him? Which means he did not see him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the sight. That seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a gift which is kept for Jannah, for paradise. Those who enter paradise, they will all have whatever they want in paradise. And on top of that, they will be asked, do you have whatever you want? And they will all say, let me word it differently. And we will all say, Alhamdulillah, may Allah make us from them. And we will all say, yes. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, I have something more for you. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةً for those who have done good, they will get good in return. And we will give them even more. They have excess. What is the more? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the barrier between them and him. And they will see him for the first time. And that will be the biggest gift. The biggest gift ever given to any of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us from amongst them. Imagine to look at your Rabb. Today we look at people and we say, MashaAllah, good looking. And we look at motor vehicles and we look at cars and houses and so many different things. And we look at sceneries and we get excited. What about the maker of all that? Subhanallah. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. May Allah grant us the sweetness of looking at him as is in the dua of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he came down sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the same evening he was back in his same bedding. The bedding still warm, which means it had not yet struck dawn and he was back. Subhanallah. And he tells those who are around him, Umm Muhani, according to one of the narrations, what had happened. And immediately they believe immediately because they knew that this is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, I'm going to go out and announce this to Quraysh. Um Muhani, according to one narration, says, don't go out and announce it because they might not believe you. They'll make a mockery of you. He says, no. He has been told to deliver the message. So he went out and he announced it. He called the people and the Abu Jahl and them came running because they wanted to know what is this man calling us for now when we've been persecuting him so much. Now what does he want? Maybe he wants to strike a deal. They went forth and he says, I have been taken up at night into the seven heavens and I traveled from here to Jerusalem all in one night and I returned and came back before the morning. They started laughing, scoffing. What a joke. This is impossible. And then they spoke to Abu Bakr, as Siddiq radiallahu anhu, asked him a question. Would you believe if someone tells you that they went from here to Baytul Maqdis in one night and from there, same night going all the way up to the seven heavens, coming down and so on. Your friend says this. He says, well, if he says it, I believe it. If he says it, I believe it. He was the first one whom without even a pause immediately said, if he said it, it's the truth. This is why he was known as as Siddiq, the one who was not only truthful himself, but the one who, re who recognized the truth immediately and surrendered to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who recognize the truth and who can surrender to it immediately. As I said yesterday, sometimes we know the truth, but we don't surrender to it because of our weakness. Why is that the case? May Allah strengthen us to dress properly. May He strengthen us to fulfill our prayers properly. Wallahi, don't be mistaken. There are people across the globe who are far less fortunate than us who are 
making an effort to obey Allah's instructions and their effort is far more fruitful than ours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and make it easy for us. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter was asked questions by the people of Quraysh because there was a buzz. Now in Quraysh, people are talking, did you hear this madman? What happened to him? He came here, he did, says he did this and did that. And these people who believe him are even more mad, are even more mad. There were some believers who were weak, who had taken a little bit of time before they actually surrendered to it. But subhanallah, the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers came up with questions. Some of them had visited Jerusalem. So what had happened is, they asked a question, describe for us Jerusalem, describe it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa started describing very accurately, door by door, house by house, describing everything. This is, the, this is how you enter, this is what happens, this is where, this is, this is where, that is. They were shocked and gobsmacked, no response. The people of Quraysh, no response. So they asked him another question. They said, okay, our caravan that is on its way, did you see it? He said, yes, I saw it. And you know what? It is at the moment in such and such a place returning to Medina. And there is a white camel which has a black spot on it that is right in the front. And if you expect it on such and such a day, it will be coming, uh, sorry, in Mecca, sorry, not Medina. It will be arriving at this particular place and it will be coming here and you will see it. And lo and behold, exactly what happened, exactly what happened. And he mentioned the water and he mentioned how much was on it and what happened and how many camels they were and the people and all the details, subhanAllah. So much so that when for a moment he had paused because he was trying to remember what exactly had happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the image again in front of him as he was sitting there. And then he began to describe it and it's in front of him. And he says, not only this caravan you are asking about, Another two caravans, he described them and where they were and what happened. Subhan Rabbi Al A'la. Quraysh still gobsmacked. Allahu Akbar. Quraysh still gobsmacked. There is an important point. At that juncture, they said, This man is a magician and he is a fortune teller. He can tell fortune. That's what it is. And they quickly just sidelined him. Whereas he came with Quran that prohibited. Not only fortune telling, but magic as well. This evening we heard verses, subhanallah, powerful verses. Musa alayhi salatu was salam. What, what did he say? Qala Musa, ma Moses told the Pharaoh and the magicians that what you people have come with is magic. What I have come with is a sign from Allah. And then he says, Inna Allah sayubtiluh. Allah will destroy that magic. Magic is doomed completely. It will be destroyed because Allah does not allow those who engage in corruption on the earth to succeed. They won't succeed. The deeds of those who are corrupt, they don't succeed no matter what. So these were verses we heard. That same Quran how can the man who brought it engage in magic? And how can the man who brought it, who says, Man ata arrafan aw kahinan fasaddaqahu bima akhbar, faqad kafara bima unzila ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever goes to a fortune teller or a soothsayer and believes what the fortune teller has to say, has disbelieved in what Muhammad came with. Subhanallah. May Allah safeguard us. And the same man, they calling him a fortune teller. Do you see? Allahu Akbar. Allah opens the doors for whomsoever he wishes and he closes the doors upon whomsoever he wishes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. What is important is when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up into the heavens, he was taken on a tour. He was taken on a tour. A tour to see what? To see heaven and to see hell. And he saw certain things in heaven and he saw certain things in hell. He saw in quite a bit of detail how the people of hell were being punished. And when he came back, he told us that the people who eat interest were being punished in a specific way. Those who commit adultery were being punished in a specific way. Those who engage in this sin were being punished in a specific way. And then he says, Ya Bilal, O oh Bilal, what is it that you do do? When I was in touring paradise, I heard your footsteps in paradise. Sami'tu khashkhashataka fil jannah. He says, I heard this khashkhasha. Khashkhasha is the sound of a little slipper when you're walking. And later on it was discovered 
that Bilal ibn Rabah, who was a slave, who was freed by the Muslims. He was a slave of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, and he was freed by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was from Africa. It was later discovered that whenever he made wudu, whenever he washed, he did not allow the wudu to expire without reading two rak'ah of salah. Soon as he completed his wudu, he would read two rak'ah of salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those really who are steadfast and from those who can fulfill our salah. Those people read salah out of the love of Allah. That at that particular time, it was not yet made compulsory. It was there, but not made compulsory. But at that stage, when the Prophet ﷺ came down and he told his people the following day, it became compulsory to say the prayer five times a day. And that was happening or that happened from the moment of Mi'raj. Now, one might ask, how did the Prophet ﷺ learn how to pray and how to make wudu? If you recall, we made mention of it. Early on, when he was granted prophethood and his wife Khadija binti Khuwaylid radiallahu anha was there, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came and made wudu and he repeated the wudu after him and he read two rak'ah of salah which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam repeated after him and that is how he knew how to pray in the initial stages but the prayer was not five times a day and it was not compulsory. This is why Aisha radiallahu anha says that when salah first came down, it was mathna, mathna. We just used to read two rak'ah, two rak'ah, two rak'ah for every salah and we just used to have units of two. That's it. But later on, after the day of Mi'raj, the following day, Jibreel alayhi salam came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two days in a row. The first day, he came and he led salah at the beginning time of every prayer. So by that, the beginning time was known. And the next day, he led salah at the ending time of every prayer. And in that way, the ending time was known. So now we would know how there is a beginning time of every salah and there is an ending time of every salah. Because that was taught by Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam was given this and shown it. Do you know what we learn from this? One of the points is that when we lead by example, we actually leave a greater mark than when we just speak about something and we have not yet led by example. Even with our children, one is to tell them, do this and do that. The other, let them see you doing it. They will do it automatically. They will fight with you to dress with a scarf when they see you dressed appropriately. But you're in a little tighty, moving around, showing half of your belly, and you're telling your child to wear a scarf or to dress decently. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Without one word, you can achieve it if you're ready to do it. But you can speak mountains full of words. It won't happen. In fact, it becomes worse as the generations pass. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So this is how Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam had came and taught the salah and the Muslims had read salah and subhanallah from that day on the salah had been compulsory this prayer that we have khamsu salawatin fi kulli yawmin wa layla remember one thing one of the biggest gifts you can ever you can ever have is if Allah has granted you the acceptance to fulfill your salah upon its beginning time that is a gift which means as salatu ala waqtiha Salah upon its beginning time. That's the biggest gift because shaitan, one of his plans, and I'm sure all of us have been affected by this at some stage. One of his plans is to tell you, don't worry, there's still a bit of time. That is the plan of the devil to distract you. Don't worry, there's still a bit of time. So what happens? We say, okay, there's 20 minutes. And before you know it, you get a phone call. Hey, there's five minutes. And before you know it, the adhan of the next salah is on. Oh, I missed it. But I really wanted to read it. Well, you know what? You should have really wanted to know how shaitan operates as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. This is shaitan. He operates in a very systematic way. He knows how man thinks. This is why don't leave what you have to do for even the next moment if you can do it in this moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us goodness. Now the persecution continued. The people of Makkah had something new to laugh about. And the mu'mineen, subhanallah, it increased their iman. Verses were being revealed every single day. Revelation was coming. Most of the days revelation was coming. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came down with verses. What type of verses were revealed in Makkah? 
All the stories of the prophets were revealed in Mecca. All the surahs which start with the separated letters were revealed in Mecca besides the first two. All of them. And what else? The short verses which have in them about belief. One Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life after death. Heaven and hell. All this was revealed in Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. And what is going to happen in heaven and hell and so on. So to do with belief, the issue of the angels, the issue of destiny and so on. This was revealed in Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. This were the type or these were the type of verses that were revealed in Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims really enjoyed, enjoyed the verses coming down. That was a comfort for them and they would forget the persecution. They would forget what happened because they would achieve the sweetness of these words and more and more were entering the fold of Islam, but quietly in a way that others don't know. And even if they got to know and they were persecuted, they did not mind. There came a time when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had had enough. Now he began to look for another base. He had tried out Ta'if, didn't work. Now he started going to the festivals of the Arabs. They used to have lots of festivals. Some of them known as Ukal and Mijannah and Dhul Majaz and some of them based in different places. But the biggest was during Hajj, the Mosim of Hajj, the festival or season of Hajj. What used to happen in these festivals? A few things. One is they were dealing products, buying, selling, you know, this way, that way. And another is each one used to boast and brag about their lineage and what they've achieved and their language and how powerful they were. And each one used to have his own poetry and the other one used to come and praise the poetry and the other one, another man came with better poetry. So they would turn to him and consider this one, that and this one. And they brought the news and tafakhur. They wanted to be one above the other. And that's why they got together to boast. It was like a show basically. So Muhammad sallallahu used to go there and he used to seize the opportunity with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and sometimes some of the other companions at night he used to go to the dwellings, the tents where they used to sleep and he used to speak to them. Where are you people from? I am a messenger. I have brought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a message to worship Allah alone and to uh, not to bury your daughters alive and to fulfill the covenant unto Allah, not to steal, not to cheat, not to commit adultery and so on. And some of them responded with great negativity and some of them responded with a little bit of positivity, meaning either way. And there were some people who actually went out back to Quraysh and told them that this man here is trying this and that. During the daytime, he would walk through. He would walk through these whilst the festivals going on and so on. And he would utter a loud Ayyuhannas, ya ayyuhannas, qulu la ilaha illallah, tuflihu. Same statement. Oh people, say there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and you will be successful. And he continued uttering. And you know, one of the leaders of Quraysh was known as Abu Lahab, an uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like a little child, he would run behind Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and scream, Hey, don't listen to this man, he's a madman. Hey, this man, he's a madman. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept repeating these words. So people were watching. The one who really looks mad is the guy at the back, isn't it? Because he looks foolish. This man, let him do his thing. Come on, subhanallah. But this man who's supposed to be a leader of Quraysh running behind him saying, Hey, he's a madman. Watch out, he's going to di divert you from the worship of your forefathers and so on. And he came up with statement after statement. Wallahi, it was a joke. But people gathered around Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without uttering. They didn't say we agree or we disagree. They heard. Now there was a difference between the people of Mecca and the people from elsewhere. The people of elsewhere in some cases had had the opportunity to mix with Jews or Christians. So to them it was not new if they heard about life after death because the pagans of Mecca did not believe in life after death. So when Muhammad came with a message to the people of Mecca telling them that there is a life after death, you are answerable for every action of yours. They laughed at it because they used to do as they wished. But the others, when they heard it, they were quiet. The reason is they had already heard it from others and they knew that there is something like this. So much so that the people of Medina, which was known as Yathrib at the time, it was renamed after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Madina. Al-Madinatul Nabawiyya or Al-Madinatul Munawwara, the city that is 
enlightened, the city that is lit up, or the city of the Prophet. It has many, many names, subhanAllah. But the old name was Yathrib. They had mixed with the Jews, and the Jews used to tell them that there is a Prophet that is about to be sent at this moment, and we will follow him, and we will fight together with him against you, and we are going to destroy you like Ad and Thamud have been destroyed before. So they knew that there is something going to happen. When they heard this man, they were quiet. However, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he continued, there were a few people who listened to him. And he used to see them. He used to go out, as we said, quietly at night into their tents and have a good discussion with them. Look, I would like you to protect me from Quraysh. I'm a prophet of Allah. And Allah will protect me, but I have been instructed to seek the assistance of people. So why don't you come and believe? Believe in Allah. We are calling towards goodness. We are not calling towards anything bad. We are calling towards that which will result in your success. So some of them showed a little bit of interest, but they were worried about their clans. Because remember, these were just small groups of people. Their clans were left back in their own areas. They had to have message from them to say, okay, bring the man forth and so on. We will look after him. Without that, there was no guarantee. So this is why some of them, they accepted Islam without saying openly that we've accepted Islam. From amongst them was a man known as Suwayd ibn Samit. When the Prophet ﷺ went to him and told him that, do you know, I am a messenger and I have with me something. He says, well, I also have something with me. So the Prophet ﷺ says, what do you have? He says, I have the words of Luqman, Luqman the wise. So the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, say them to me. So he started saying the words. You know, we have it in Surah Luqman. We have a whole Surah named after Luqman. According to us and according to the narrations and scholars, he was not a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but a wise man. And it is reported that he was from Sudan, from Noba, which is in Sudan. And he was a man who was very, very wise, granted wisdom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Luqman. So when this man said the words of Luqman alayhi salatu was salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to him, I have something even better than that. So this man says, Suwayd ibn Samit says, what do you have? He says, I have Quran which is revealed and recited and it is full of meaning. So he says, okay, recite it. So the Prophet ﷺ began to recite the Quran. And this man after that did not leave the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't leave Nabi ﷺ. He accepted it without uttering that I've accepted this faith. He was worried. See, people at the time always worried about family and worried about what's going to happen. I'm going to be persecuted and so on. Up to today, the same worries. You have reverts who revert to Islam. Their families make life difficult for them. And their people expel them. And sometimes we as Muslims don't do any good to them because we look at them with skepticism. Why did this person accept Islam? You know, maybe they're here to spy on Islam and the Muslims. Audhu Billah. So what? Most people who have spied on Islam have turned to real Islam. Subhanallah. Because after they come in to listen to what goes on in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they realize the Muslims are the ones, they don't waste time in the house of Allah. They don't speak about anything that is non-beneficial. They get straight to the point, they call you towards Allah and that's it. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call towards Allah, not towards himself. So this man, he remained and thereafter he went back to his people in Medina. Suwayd ibn Samit was from Medina. He went back to his people in Medina. But he did not tell anyone. There was a huge war that took place after he went back. Known as Bu'ath. Yawmu Bu'ath. It was a war that took place between Aus and Khazraj. And so many people were killed. He was one of them who was killed. And his people say, we bear witness that this man was a Muslim. Ever since he came back from that festival and he met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was not the same, he was a Muslim. So his people bore witness he was a Muslim, but he did not propagate the deen. That was one man. Then there were people from Banu Amir, a place in Sabah, in the Yemen region. They had come and there were good discussions between Muhammad sallallahu and them. But there was a stumbling block. What was it? They said, okay, you're going to come to us in Yemen. We'll take you in. Everything will happen. Your message will go and you know, the people will accept it. But once they accept it, and when you leave, everything must be handed to us and we must be in control of this whole new religion. That was the stumbling block. He said, no, 
Allah will decide what will happen to us and what will happen to leadership in this particular ummah. So you can't say that now you will start controlling all the people from everywhere who are going to accept the message. So they said, well, if that's the case, why should we sacrifice? Why should we sacrifice? And then when you are gone, the honor must go to someone else. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us honor. Today you can be an Arab or you can be a non-Arab. You can be an African or an Asian or an American or a European. You can be anything you want. The, the honor and dignity that Allah grants you through Islam is something that goes beyond the boundaries or the limits or the lines of race. Completely beyond. So Allah grants honor to a person who comes from anywhere on the globe. He can be from the subcontinent, from Australia, no matter where. Today, the globe is a small little village. We know people who we've never met, but we know them through the internet, subhanallah. And what happens? Allah has granted them such a high status through Islam, and yet they are of a totally different race. Imagine if this was only blocked to one race to say, you want to know anything about religion? You must only do it through the Chinese. One wonders what would happen. Allah protect us. I don't know what made me say China. But there are a lot of Muslims in China as well. Millions of them, subhanAllah. May Allah protect them and grant them ease and goodness. Since we've mentioned them, we mention that people are being persecuted on the globe and they are still keeping their deen. With us, mashallah, look at us. We're sitting in the house of Allah as free as anything. We're not persecuted at all. Alhamdulillah. Thank Allah and make use of these days by getting closer to your maker. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So those were the people of Banu Amir. There was another believer who believed in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was a young boy who came in a group of people, the group of Anas ibn Rafi' who was also known as Abu al-Haysar. And they had come, this young boy's name was Iyas ibn Mu'adh. And he came as a young boy and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam met them at the festival and he presented Islam to them, read some Quran to them, told them that these people were from, they had actually come in order to strike a treaty with Quraysh so that they could be protected from Khazraj in Medina because they were fighting. So they went to Quraysh to say, look, you know what? Their intention was to go and say, we want you to protect us from these people and please can you help us? So when the Prophet ﷺ heard that these people had come to meet Quraysh, he quickly went to them and he presented Islam to them and said, I am a messenger and I am a person who is sent by Allah. And my message, I'm not calling towards myself. I'm calling towards worshipping the maker, the cherisher, nourisher, sustainer, creator, the one whom we are going to return to. Worship him and worship him alone. So what happened is, these people from Medina, they had known because they had heard this from the Jewish people and the people of the book whom they had interacted with in the past and who were living in that region. So this young boy known as Iyas ibn Mu'ad, he says to the others, this man is right. He is saying he has to offer something better than what you have come for. You came for signing a treaty with Quraysh, sign a treaty with your maker, better. So Iyas says, yes, it's good. But this man, the leader of that group, got up and scolded him, said, hey, keep quiet, don't be distracted. And they carried on. So this young boy, he had Iman in his heart. When he went back to Medina, he also died after the day of Bu'ath, the day of that war that took place. He died as well, a young boy known as Iyas ibn Mu'ad. And his companions say that this man, we could hear him at night declaring the greatness of Allah. Tasbih and Tahleel and Takbir. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. We could hear him say this, which means he was a Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ confirmed this also in a narration. He was the second person who had accepted Islam but was unable to propagate the message. So this was the first, the beginnings of Islam in Medina Munawwara, but it was not spread until Allah favored the people of Medina. That day of Bu'ath, there was such a great war that most of the leaders were killed. Now when the leaders are gone, what happens? There is a bit of chaos. When the leaders are there and Islam is presented to them, what did they used to say in, in Mecca? They used to say, no ways, we're going to lose our chair, our seat. You know, when there's a man sitting on a chair, he doesn't want anyone else to sit on that chair. It happens. So for as long as he's alive, there's no hope. The minute he's dead, what will happen? There is a lot of hope because now, Things can change. Allahu Akbar. So this is what happened in Medina Munawwara. When the, those leaders were dead, 
They were looking for someone to lead them. They were divided into two main clans, Al Aus and Khazraj. These two used to fight forever and ever. They've always been fighting. And they were at war. They killed so many of one another. Now that there was a massive war where so many of their leaders had passed away, there was a little bit of a stalemate and they were just licking their wounds and counting their losses. And in the meantime, the festival happened. When that festival happened, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa met a group of six of them. We need to remember these six. Subhanallah. He told them, where are you from? They said, we're from Yathrib. Can I sit and talk to you for a little while? He said, yes. You know, if we sit and read the, the etiquette of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as a messenger, how he sat with these people, how he presented Islam, how he respected them, how he answered their questions, we will learn a lot of diplomacy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. How we speak to people is very important. Sometimes this tongue can destroy a home, a house, because we don't know how to talk. And what, what can happen, subhanallah, because we've used our tongue correctly, we can build relations even with people who may be enemies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So he met six people and he sat down and had a chat with them. He gave them the story of Islam. These six were As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu, later on to be known. Awf ibn al-Harith. Rafi ibn Malik, Qutbah ibn Amir, Uqba ibn Amir, and Jabir ibn Abdullah. These were people from Khazraj. When they were told in the 11th year of prophethood that this is the message of Allah, and there is heaven, and there is hell, and you are answerable, and so on, they told each other, do you know what? This is what the Jews are speaking about all the time. And now that the Jews have always been telling us there's a prophet about to come, we've got a feeling this is the man and let us believe in him quickly because the message is exactly what they have been saying it would be. And if we believe in him, subhanallah, we will be successful. The six of them accepted Islam and they went back to their people and started teaching Islam. Inshallah, tomorrow we will see how the migration to, Mac to Medina Munawwara had started and how it occurred by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless us. May he bless not only this, these six whom we have just mentioned, but all those who struggle and strive for the deen. And may he make us from amongst them. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayy al-qayyum.